Hi there, and thank you for joining Change I Am Possible, India's first future tech podcast. Do kindly subscribe, support, and share. So the food industry is waiting to get disrupted. Post COVID nineteen, the world is going to be more aware and mindful on what is on their dinner table. So. 80% to 90% of the global population consumes non-veg and animals are known to be host for pathogens that can unleash deadly viruses on mankind so i spoke with paul shapiro author of national best seller clean meat how growing meat without animals will revolutionize dinner and the world he is also the ceo and co-founder of the better meat company who are creating meat with their allergen free plant protein formulas he is also the host for the business for good podcast i think we will soon have food that could be modified as per our taste with the necessary nutrients for a healthy and long life i wish you enjoy this conversation so you are a national best seller right you have written a book clean meat so could you tell our audience who don't know much about you what the book is all about let me be on not not the background on just the, the, the clean meat Sure, Eddie. So first, thanks for having me. Great to be on with you. Second, the book Clean Meat really explores the race between the entrepreneurs, the investors, and the scientists who are all working diligently to commercialize the world's first slaughter-free meat. So the book Clean Meat tells their story. It's really more of a pop business book where it tells the story of the people who are forming this movement really the culture of meat or the cultivated meat movement to grow not alternatives to meat, not substitutes to meat, but real actual animal meat that is simply divorced from having to raise and slaughter animals. Lovely, lovely. How cool is that? And a great thing which is about to happen is the technology is converging and it's impacting all possible, you know, verticals, you know, food. Food is one, one side which is going to be revolutionized with this coming technology, whether it's, whether it's, uh, cultured meat or whether it's plant-based meat, right? So you're also the f- founder of uh, Better Meat, right? So could, could you give, give some details on your startup? You got it, Eddie. So the Better Meat Co. is an early stage startup. We were co-founded uh, just less than two years ago. So that is, uh, you know, we're recording this now in February of 2020. So in short, what we do is we make plant-based protein formulas that we sell as ingredients on a B2B basis to major meat users so that they can use a lot fewer animals and use more plants. So by blending our plant proteins into their meat, they can enhance the taste, the nutrition, and the sustainability of their products. Right. Lovely. So so can can you give me the difference between the plant-based protein formula and cell cultured meat? Yeah, sure. So plant-based meats are fantastic. Plant-based meats are where you take plants and you make them taste and have the texture of actual meat. It tastes great, uh, but it's not meat. It's not meat from an animal. It's meat from plants, but it's not meat from (coughs) an animal. Whereas cultivated meat, or what you just called cell-cultured meat, is real animal meat that is grown from animal cells as opposed to animal slaughter. So in short, what you have is a tiny little biopsy from an animal and let's say like a a chicken and then you take that little tiny biopsy and there's millions of cells at the microscopic level in there that can continue to grow meat even outside of the animal and so you can put them inside of a cultivator that mimics the conditions that they would have inside of that chicken's body and those cells do exactly what they would do were they still in the body they grow into actual chicken meat. And so you don't have to grow the skeleton and the beak and the eyeballs. You're just growing the muscle and the fat that you actually want. And so this is why cultivated meat is oftentimes called queen meat because it is like queen energy, just better for the environment. And it is cleaner from a food safety perspective. Think about it. Right now, a lot of chicken in its raw state has pathogens like E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter. And these are intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't cook our meat extremely thoroughly. Well, with clean meat, you don't have to worry as much about intestinal pathogens because there are no intestines at all. You're just growing the muscle that you actually want to eat. So it's a big improvement for the planet 
It's a big improvement for consumer safety. And of course, it's an improvement for the animals as well. Could you elaborate on that? You know, when, when, you're, when you're building meat in a lab, how safe is that? Well, it's a lot safer, first of all, but it, I mean, from a food safety perspective, you can also make it actually better than meat. So if you want to have meat that has less saturated fat and perhaps, let's say, more omega-3 fatty acids, you could theoretically make a burger that rather than causing heart attacks actually helps prevent them. Um, but we should keep in mind that it's not really truthful to say that it's grown in a lab. I mean, most food products do start out in an R&D test facility that is a laboratory, but they go on to be produced at scale in production factories. So, for example, if you were to go to a beer brewery for a major beer company, let's say like, um, you know, Coors or Sam Adams, you would have massive bioreactors You'd have PhD microbiologists in white lab coats and clipboards writing down things, but you don't call it lab-grown beer. You just call it beer because it's in a brewery, and that's really how clean meat will be produced in essentially like a brewery where in just like a beer brewery, you have these big uh, stainless steel fermenters, but instead of fermenting yeast cells, like brewer's yeast cells, they'll be fermenting animal cells. Right. Yeah, but obviously, you know, there's a difference between beer, which is alcohol, to food. You know, the food becomes sacred, especially, you know, in Indian context, right? I mean, you know, food is, you know, we worship food over here, like cows and the animals. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so, and, and there's obviously there's a certain section of people who are ex uh, vegetarian. So obviously, they would love the plant-based protein formula, right? But, do, uh, but uh, is there a scalability issue over here when you're saying that you're building these formulas? You know, supposing when you're saying that you're building these plant-based protein formulas, you know, so what, what do you do? You you can like mix them in, in these uh, meat based. What's the mi mix mixing percentage? Is it hybrid or is it 100% uh, plant-based? Well, just in the same way that if you think about the problem of fossil fuels, it's so severe. The problem of climate change is so severe that you want lots of alternatives. You want wind energy, you want solar energy, you want geothermal energy, and more. The problem of factory farming of animals is also so severe that you want lots of options. So you want plant-based meat, you want cultivated meat, you want hybrid products that have both animal protein and plant protein combined in them. Uh, you want lots of different options. So when you think about the world of sustainable protein, the real goal is to reduce our reliance on the exploitation of animals, to ensure that we can raise fewer animals and enjoy protein that comes from plants, from cells, from microbes, um, and more. And so that's really what we mean when we're talking about sustainable protein. And uh, certainly, I think there's a lot of people today who eat meat not because an animal was slaughtered for it, but really in spite of the fact that an animal was slaughtered for it. And there are lots of people who, if they could continue enjoying meat without having to slaughter animals, would be quite happy to do so. I, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. As long as if you get the taste, the the, the smell, uh, right? I, I think there's a lot of people who would be, who would want to con, uh, convert. And, and you rightfully said, I mean, you know, at this point in time, I think there's some 14.5 percent of global greenhouse emission, which is due to livestock uh, rearing, and also 70 percent of antibiotics sold for uh, are, are mostly for animals in the US. So, so obviously there's plus uh, like a. Uh, uh, Farming an animal, it, it, it's a huge, huge uh, resource uh, hungry, uh, this thing, it, it takes land, water, and, and yeah. And plus the cruelty. So yes, I mean, I think we, the, 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 there's a huge revolution which is waiting for food tech to happen. So, but tell me, is the perception been a problem so far or is there the, the regulatory body, is that a problem? Because I mean, specifically in India, I mean, you know, we, we've extremely, uh, I mean, not just India, I guess most, most of the people, I, I think are very uh, hung up about the conversation of natural unnatural right right now i mean if you see with with, with since, since bio your 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 biotech with the food the, mm -hmm. the, 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 we be in the cusp of redesigning everything we are in the cusp of redesigning mankind we, we, we genetically engineering mosquitoes we, we genetically engineering food there's also there's just this company called aqua bounty which i believe is uh, breeding uh, or building uh, salmon which is going to be uh, right. 
much bigger in size compared to you know you know regular salmon so yes i think we we we, we are at, at this cusp of this huge revolution uh, when it comes to food tech what's the perception been in america when it comes to uh, food which is plant based protein or whether it's cell culture which is cultured meat which is grown in a lab you know uh, what's the perception like Eddie, you raise a lot of really uh, important and valid points. And so what I would suggest is the following. Think about how meat is produced today. Just take chicken to go back to that example. Most of the chickens who are raised for food are genetically selected to grow so big, so fast, that many of them have difficulty even taking a few steps before they collapse underneath their unnatural bulk. They're confined wing to wing inside of windowless warehouses by the tens of thousands where they live in their own feces. And then when it's time to take them to slaughter, most of us don't want to know what happens. And so when you think about just how unnatural and inhumane and unsustainable our current methods of meat production are, the idea of producing meat in a much cleaner, more humane, more environmentally friendly manner seems naturally like a preferable thing to do. Now, nearly nothing that we eat today is natural. Even a piece of fruit, even an organic piece of fruit still is a far cry from the fruit that it was domesticated from uh, hundreds of years ago. And so our fruit today looks nothing like it did before humans began tinkering with the genome of the fruit. No, not through genetic modification, but through selective breeding programs that have uh, persisted for centuries now, really. And uh, as a result, we shouldn't get uh, deluded by the fantasy that our food today is somehow natural. It isn't. But we do know that certain types of food production, as you correctly alluded to, Eddie, are much more damaging for the planet than others. And producing animal protein just takes a lot of land, takes a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, lots of uh, other risks such as pandemic flu, antibiotic resistance, animal cruelty concerns, and more. So we should do away with the fantasy that the foods that we eat today are somehow uh, natural and recognize that we should feed ourselves wholesome foods that don't do so much harm to the planet in the process. And that is the promise of these type of alternative proteins. Tell me, I mean, what is the the problem at this time? Where is the technology? Where does it stand? Is there a scalability yeah. issue? And if you were an investor, where would you put your bet uh, on? Would you put a bet on the plant-based protein or, or, or the cell culture? I think about this all the time, Eddie. Um, so, you know, look, I'm bullish on all of these types of uh, alternative meat production. However, we should be clear, cultivated meat, meat grown from animal cells, is still years away from making any big dent in the market. It's never been sold anywhere on the planet. And even when it does start being sold, it's going to be in, in very small quantities. And so it's probably five or 10 years away before that meat becomes more widely available to consumers. Whereas plant-based meat is actually widely available now throughout many countries. I mean, in the United States, you can go to most fast food restaurants and, and get plant-based meat today that's delicious. Um, so, you know, the plant-based meats are just doing more uh, at the current time. Uh, then you also have uh, meat created from microbes. So if you think about um, some of the companies that are doing this type of microbial uh, fermentation to create their own meats, I think that's another promising way to invest. And then what we're doing at the Better Meat Co. is creating a, uh, a ingredients that major meat companies can blend into their meat so they can use fewer animals. And that's what I think is the most exciting, which is why I decided to pursue this space, because I think it offers the fastest path to actually making a difference in food sustainability. Because plant-based meat is still a tiny little sliver of the total meat market. It's less than 1% of all the meat that is sold both in the United States and around the world. And so if we really want to make a difference, uh, yeah, we can try to help people switch over to eating plant-based meat, which is fantastic. I eat it and I really enjoy it. But... We also have to recognize that the current meat that's being sold is going to be the dominant form of protein for people for a long time to come, and we need to be able to make that better. It's in some ways, it's similar to thinking about the electric vehicle market. So if you contemplate, for example, the fact that less than 1% of vehicles sold are, uh, are electric vehicles, 
Um, but if you could improve the fuel efficiency of the other 99% of cars by hybridizing their technology, you would do an enormous amount of good to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, the, the hybrid approach of blending, I think, is where I would put my money. And that's certainly where I am putting my time right now. So tell me, I mean, you know, as uh, what's the uh, investment uh, scene over there? How are the investors uh, looking at investing in the, these uh, food-based tech companies? In India, we have a couple of startups who are actually looking at uh, clean meat, and whether it's plant-based protein meat or growing uh, cell culture meat, there are a couple of startups over here who are push driving this conversation. Uh, a, are you funded? B, what would you advise these startups? What to do? What not to do? To be successful in this space. So, to answer your question, first, Eddie, yes, the Better Meat Co is a venture capital-backed company. And uh, we're very proud of the investors we're partnered with uh, as well. Uh, you know, the reality is, is that um, this is a hot space right now. And so there is there is high investor interest. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get funding if you have a poor idea for a company. But if you have a really good idea and you have some type of experience, or you have partners who have experience, you can show that you can actually execute on this idea. I think that you'll do uh, just fine with the venture capital funds right now because uh, there's a lot of interest in the alternative and sustainable protein space. So what I would recommend if somebody is interested and they don't know where to begin, um, first of all, you can email me uh, and, and you can, Eddie, you can give out my email. It's just uh, paul.shapiro. It's paul.shapiro at bettermeat.co. So it's paul.shapiro at bettermeat.co. And I'm happy to share the names of uh, investors who are interested in this space with you. I believe that the Good Food Institute also carries a list of investors who are interested in the space. So uh, Varun Deshpande runs the, uh, the Good Food Institute in India, and uh, he's, a really, he's a really awesome guy. And I'm sure he'd be happy to help out any entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs who would like to get into this space as well. Lovely. And how sweet of that for, for, for you to share the email address because there are a lot of startups over here who's kind of exploring the space because, you know, but it's new and India is a little slow in adopting these uh, technologies, which is slightly futuristic, right? So, I mean, I thought that food tech would come in a little late, but then, you know, there are these young startups who are actually doing some really cool stuff. So, so it's exciting times, you know, I believe. So, 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 so. so Tell me, you mentioned that your your pl plant based protein is hybrid, right? I mean, at this point in time. So, okay, could you share a little details? What's the percentage of the plant based protein in, in, in your uh, regular uh, regular meat, a and uh, whether you have some partnerships at this point in time? Sure. So, we only produce plant protein formulas, but we then sell them to meat companies for them to blend into their meat so that they can hybridize their own products. So we're an ingredients company. We don't sell finished formulas, but our customers typically use our uh, our ingredients at anywhere from a 30 to 50% blend. So for example, we are partnered with Purdue Farms, which is one of the largest poultry producers in the United States. And they have released a line called Chicken Plus, which is uh, three different products. It's chicken tenders, chicken nuggets, and chicken patties. And they're now in 7,100 grocery stores throughout America. And what they are is a blend of chicken and plant-based material, and it's about a 50-50 blend, 50% plant-based, 50% chicken. And those products are selling quite well. Uh, people are really into them. And so there is a, um, you know, a validation of this concept of hybridizing that consumers really would like to have. Uh, the hybrid uh, products rather than eating products that are solely made of animal meat. You mentioned that uh, your your formula, plant-based protein formula, is a, is a hybrid thing. And that's for processed food, right? I mean, so uh, do you see processed food as the future? Because obviously there's a lot of issues related to processed food when it's the, 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 the conversation which is going on about how unhealthy processed food is. So what are your views on that? Well, let's keep in mind what we mean by processing. I mean, frozen vegetables are processed food. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a lentil soup is a, is a processed food. Uh, so, you know, not all processing is bad. 
I do think that having foods that are high in saturated fat, that are high in sugar, that are really high in sodium, that is a concern. You don't want to eat too much of those foods. But our ingredients of the Better Meat Co. are pretty, uh, pretty simple. They're the type of ingredients you would find in your own pantry at home. So we are committed to using ingredients that offer a clean label. Um, and I think it's one reason why meat companies actually like our products so much. Impossible Food and Beyond Meat are the two companies which is making all the right noise, right? So who, according to you, are the peers who are doing really good in the space? Well, certainly Impossible and Beyond get the greatest amount of headlines. They're really cool companies. I really admire them greatly. Uh, however, there are companies that sell a lot more product than them. So Morningstar Farms, for example, is the dominant player in the plant-based meat space in the United States. Uh, also, you know, companies like Corn, which is based in Britain, Q-U-O-R-N, Corn, is doing some really innovative things. It's really a cool company how they're uh, doing uh, fermentation to create these products that are, are really delicious. So I, I love eating corn products, actually. So I have all the respect in the world for Beyond and for Impossible, uh, but they are not the only two players in the game. Uh, there are plenty of others as well that are also doing some really cool things. You are extremely passionate when, when it comes to food because you, you, you've written Clean Meat, you're the founder of uh, Better Meat. You, you also have a podcast, Business for Good podcast. Can you talk about the podcast? Thanks, Eddie. Uh, I am very passionate about food because I think that food is both one of the greatest problems that we face as a species and it's one of the best solutions that we face as a species. So, you know, the foods that we eat have all different types of consequences. We can choose foods that harm us, or we can choose foods that heal us. We can choose foods that cause animal cruelty, or we can choose foods that create a culture of compassion. We can choose foods that heat up the planet, or we can choose foods that leave a lighter footprint. And that choice is up to us. But we should not delude ourselves into thinking that our food choices are merely personal, because they're not. They have a huge effect on the rest of the world, not just ourselves. And that is one reason I wrote the book, Clean Meat. That's a reason why I co-founded the Better Meat Co. And it's one reason I do the Better the uh, Business for Good podcast, which is not solely about food, though it often is. But the Business for Good podcast really explores the world of entrepreneurship to help solve social problems. So it's not just uh, looking at um, people who start companies that are really cool companies. It's companies that are designed to solve a serious social problem. So I have interviewed on there, for example, Indian entrepreneurs like uh, Bharti Singla from an Indian company that actually created a really cool filter that you can put on the back of a diesel pipe and it captures the black particulate, like the soot, that would be uh, polluting the air, and then they convert it into ink and then sell that ink. And so it's a really cool idea to help clean up air in certain Indian cities, but not just clean it up, actually make it profitable to do so by selling the ink. Or uh, a, couple, um, uh, a couple of really awesome uh, entrepreneurs in San Francisco, uh, Ryan Pandya, who is an Indian-American um, whose family is from India. He was born in the United States. And Paramal Gandhi, who was born in India and then later moved to the United States, who co-founded a company called Perfect Day, where they are making real milk proteins without cows. So they, are, they found a way to get microbes to actually produce actual milk proteins without having to have a cow ever involved in the process. So the show really tells the story of these entrepreneurs who are using the power of business and commerce to help solve serious problems from climate change, air pollution, animal welfare concerns, and more. So tell me, when do you see this, this technology being completely ready? So yes, it's, it, it, in all fairness, it's in this nascent stage. I mean, there are lots of startups all around the world who are exploring this space. I mean, you know, uh, when do you see the world shifting from yeah. uh, real meat, where it's slaughtered meat, to plant-based protein meat or cells. Sure. Well, that process is slowly but surely beginning to happen. And I think that if you look at plant-based milk, you can see how the process occurs. Plant-based milk a decade ago was probably about 1% of the fluid milk market in the United States. Today, it's about 13%. 
and is projected to continue increasing. So it doesn't happen overnight. It's a decades long process. But I do think that within a few decades from now, uh, people will no longer think of protein as being synonymous with a hunk of flesh from a slaughtered animal. Instead, they will be thinking of protein in a far more diverse manner. They'll be thinking of protein from plants, protein from animal cells, protein from microbes, blended forms of protein that are coming from different sources. And so no longer will we have such a boring array of protein choices because we're going to have a much more diverse world of protein that uh, is not available to a lot of people today. Paul, it was a complete pleasure talking to you and getting to know about really, you know, what you're doing, your company, what's the vision for not just you, but also your company. I would like to see a world in which feeding ourselves sustainably is something that is possible. Right now, we are destroying the planet by feeding ourselves in the very voracious and wasteful way that we're doing it. We are leaving a trail of animal cruelty, a trail of greenhouse gas emissions, a trail of deforestation. And so I envision a world in which we can feed ourselves with a tiny little sliver of the resources that we need to feed ourselves today. A world in which feeding ourselves doesn't mean destroying our only home that we actually have. The Better Meat Co. is going to be part of that solution. We're not going to do it all but we are going to be part of creating a better world where we can dramatically lighten the footprint that humanity is leaving on our planet. And in doing so, we won't only be making the world better for ourselves, we'll be making it for the rest of the creatures on our planet as well. Because for too long, we have viewed the other animals on this planet merely as commodities for us to use however we would like. And I would like a world in which our relationship with other animals is one that is no longer based solely on violence and domination, but rather one that is based on compassion and respect. That's the type of world I'm working for. And that's the type of world I think that the alternative protein industry can help to usher in. Not on its own, but it's a big part of the solution. Lovely, lovely. On that note, thank you. It was a complete pleasure talk, uh, to talking to you and wish you the very best for your vision. I'm sure it'll come true. And because I guess we're living in this this time where, where there's fantastic things are happening and entrepreneurs such as yourself are working on solving this huge problem. And I'm sure that we, 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 we're going to come to a point where we will see the light that killing animals was is wrong. Plus, I mean, none of the, the environmental problem which it, which it poses. So thank you for being part of Change by our possible podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see, please press the subscribe, uh, subscribe button. And like always, I'm going to leave behind all the details behind so you can get in touch with Mr. Shapiro because that's what it's all about. It's about building a couple community and getting in touch with each other and growing the ecosystem. So Thank you once again, Paul, for being part of Change. I possibly really appreciate this. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. It's my pleasure, Eddie. Thank you.